arrives like in Marblehead before you even started the business? How did you arrive in Marblehead? I arrived in Marblehead because I got married and my husband lived here after college. And then I uh, started working, um, I was an art teacher at the high school. I was the sole art teacher there, taking the place of the head of the art department who had gone on sabbatical and I had no idea what I was doing. And then the next year I had wangled my way into teaching and then I got pregnant with my first daughter and they wouldn't let me teach. And then when I had Melissa, um, I did do some other teaching in Woburn and other areas till I could get back and then I got back to the Marblehead Junior High School and I had 600 students a week and it was driving me crazy. The other art teacher there asked me if I wanted to teach a silk screening course at the Marblehead Arts Association and I had worked with them on, I did a lot of courses for children and a lot of different media and stuff in my spare time and um, so I figured I knew more than the people I was teaching and so I said yes and that's been my motto ever since instead of saying why I say why not so and that's where I met Kathy in the first the serigraphy that's what I taught printing on paper and then she wanted to learn how to print on fabric so we did another course and here we are I knew enough to teach other people who didn't know anything <laughs> So how did you get to that class? I moved to Marblehead in 1965. Um, I had a new baby and was a stay-at-home mom. Then when I was pregnant with my daughter four years later, I um, basically, I was, I was always a crafts person, knitting and doing things like that. And I did potato printing for fabrics for the nursery and thought, you know, there has to be an easier way. <laughs> and so that's when I took the silk screening class from Molly. How did we go from a silk screening class to a business venture? We wanted to print, learn how to print yardage and, you know, and, and we were right. financing our printing uh, by wanting to sell, you know, just some of the things we printed so we could buy more fabric and more well, ink and do it that way. The back room of my house on 39 Front Street which eventually became a kitchen, but at that time wasn't. And we set up printing some tables there. And Kathy and I made our own, the, the frames for, and, and stretched the silk over them. We did our, we knew how to, you have to put the design on the frame and then block out the rest of the things so the ink dye doesn't go through. We did that in this tiny space and we'd roll our fabric up and it get all these marks on it and stuff. That was in November. Yeah, 1970, I think. And then that in that following winter, we decided to have open houses at our at my <coughs> at my house, and we had our fabric out there. I don't know if we'd made anything at that. Yeah, we point. had the neckties. Remember? We, oh, we, we had neckties. Nec we had some. And we made it some. I didn't. We make the. I think we made the baby quilts. Yes. Because we were thinking babies and yeah. the, for carriage quilts. Yeah. So they weren't even crib quilts. They were carriage quilts. Well, that's what Lisa Carl and then we invited anybody we knew who were interested in sewing, interested in design, interested in fabrics, interested in mm -hmm. art, and they came. So the mm -hmm. idea originally maybe was it not so much of a it w wasn't a, a business. full-on no, business. No. It, it was, was more to finance no. learning more about doing it and mm -hmm. yeah. and doing it. Mm -hmm. And um, you know we learned along the way some things to do and some things not to do. And uh, originally, I think when we did have the oven, when it, we, we um, heat treated the fabric in the oven. That oh, was, yeah, the fumes was, yeah, must have been was, so toxic. Was, and then we'd hang them out and, in the back. And um, So as we saw more people getting interested in what we were doing, I think what prompted us more to get going was, I don't remember her name, but she had owned a little a shop where next to Fred Woods up on um, Washington Street and she came to us and said I'm getting out of the space are you interested and it was like a hundred dollars a month or something so I said sure and we moved our printing up to that shop so we printed in the windows there. we had two, a, two a bay table windows. on each side of you know, the center so entrance people could see us and we would be at these plywood tables silk screening fabrics there in the window, and then the back room had the products. 
But the also, we, when we were still at 39 Front Street, we got our first business, uh, uh, doing business as uh, for the town. I guess we decided we'd better do that and not get into trouble uh, if we were selling things. Mm -hmm. So in your, in your first shop on Washington Street, did you, you have an oven in the back? Were you doing all the things you were doing? How did we get to the laundromat? Yeah. There was a laundromat then. <laughs> where was the laundromat? The laundromat was where Fat Face is now. Oh, that's right. So there were bigger machines and they had higher heat and we could heat treat them. So the heat treating process was so the dye, so they wouldn't run. Right. And, uh, and we were still using oil-based <laughs> no. paints well, then. Nobody told us Oil-based uh, at that time. Yeah, so. oil-based and right. it was really toxic. Um, yeah. So I don't remember how long we were there, but were you coming up? How did you come up with designs? How did you? That's the fun part. That's <laughs> that's we, they were in our heads. Yeah, you just, yeah. you know, and simple designs, as they're just repeated. And then Kathy and I were doing, because Marimekko was really popular then, and I think that's another reason you wanted to learn how to print on right. yourself, because it was expensive fabric. Uh, our designs were pretty big, and um, which we modified later on. but. And we'd only print on a couple yards of fabric, I think, because that's all we could afford with the space. How did the name handprints come? I don't know. No. Well, you know, I think we were thinking about the Key West fabrics, the Key West handprints around, and we wanted to have something with Marblehead in it, and they were handprinted fabrics, and it just sort of caught. I don't know mm -hmm. who came up with it, but um, between the two of us, it wasn't a lack of ideas. Mm -hmm. uh, that's for right. sure. Yeah. So it just, and then when we incorporated, it became Marble and Handprints Incorporated. But I think when we were still up at the first spot on Washington Street, I found an ad that we were open like two hours or, we were open at our house, my house for a couple of hours a week and not too many hours up on uh, 78 Washington Street. It was limited, mm -hmm. we had small children. <laughs> And my so, second daughter was practically born on the printing table there on 78 Washington Street, so. Wow. So you were balancing yes. everything, work, life, right. et cetera. Yes. Mm -hmm. So that by ha being on your own, this allowed you to make your own hours and yes. do what you needed yeah. to do. Right. Which actually was always uh, <clears throat> something that we were able to do. We, that's why we were in Marblehead. We didn't move to larger, cheaper facilities from production anywhere. We always wanted to be near home so that we could come and go. And, and it, it turned out everyone could come and go, yeah. except, you know, the clerks in the stores. But we made it more flexible for us with our kids and uh, it, we just made it work. Mm -hmm. Because the expectation at that, at that time um, was that you would be the caregivers and you would be taking of care course. Of, of the right. kids. Yeah. Right. But after a while, I don't know about Kathy, but I had to, um, after they got out of, I, I did have somebody come into my house to take, to watch the kids. Everybody thought that, oh, you can do your business and have your kids on the side. And that Boston Globe or Boston, whatever it was, article about us, she thought we should have our kids playing in front of our silk screening tables. Susie and Melissa were in the cart and We box. thought they'd nap in the back yeah, room. Yeah, <laughs> right. That doesn't work. So no. I had to, um, I had Mrs. Tut, an old Marblehead figure, come in and she took care of the kids. Yeah. That must, was it hard? When were you, were you working a lot? I know you was part-time, but you're working a lot, but you're caring for the kids. I mean, right. and, and then you had husbands at the time that were right. working yeah. outside yeah. of the yeah. house. Yeah. Right. So. Okay. so it was us. Yeah. Um, I didn't find that hard. We just made it work. Yeah. And I mean, we it was were, fun. Actually. Because we had the two of us, we were av available so the other one could carry on when somebody else wasn't around. And it, it worked that way. That's true. And did, you kids, did your kids play together? Were they slightly Yeah, different? Melissa and Susie did. Yeah. They were, we. Uh, they were a year and a half apart or something. When we moved to the next location, um, we had a print shop there where that clothing store is on State Street. The corner of State and Washington. And uh, we would give cardboard boxes to the little girls and they'd make houses out on the sidewalk and you know it was uh actually <coughs> it was a garage then so we yeah. could just open the garage door when melissa started school she was at the gary school 
so they'd come home. Uh, I guess Susie went somewhere else, but come home after school and come and s stay with us at the store and at the fat and whatever. Mm -hmm. And you know, we just made it work. If we were, if I had started the business by myself or Kathy by herself, I don't think it would have worked. An adventure in a way. I mean, I think we mm -hmm. had no idea that it would become what it a complicated business. Business and. So quickly, it, when we looked at the timeline last night, yeah. it, I was shocked to see what we did in four or five years. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, really, it was uh, amazing. And if we, I think we would have been more intimidated early on if we'd known right. what well, would happen, but we just... We didn't know a lot, so we just took our chances. We sort of backed into the business, mm -hmm. but I think that was a good way for us to go instead of saying, oh, we're going to do a business and here's our business plan and this is happening, that's going to happen. And we, it was sort of an organic growth, I think. Well, and we also started <coughs> it with $50 each. Yeah. Well, in so today's <laughs> money, I don't know what that would be. Maybe 100 to today's <laughs> money. <laughs> but we would use what we Maybe did Maybe 150, that. but it wasn't very much. We'd go over to this a fabric store in Salem, and I don't remember the name of it, and buy our yardage and come back and print on it and sell it and go back and buy some more. But we, we got a 10% discount, I think. Yeah, but we, right. had, we always had those little girls with us who'd be running yeah. around, you know, while we were, I mean, it, we really, we just made it part of our lives. It was, it was fine. You know, one thing that, uh, the context of that, I think, is that there were a lot of women doing creative businesses. Things. Marblehead was a very creative place at that time with crafts. And, um, you know, Julie Keyes had a ceramic shop down there. And then men, actually, too. Charlie Kellogg had a sandal shop. There were it's two sandal creative. shops. And the jeweler. And the Skip somebody had silver. And then Tori had started her business. And Betty, uh, Brew, Betty House. Brew House with her kites. Um, and the two. The, 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 the weaving, Marblehead. Yeah, the rooms. Buchanan sisters. <coughs> and, and Jeanette, Harvey Bart, and Joanne. Uh, can't remember her last name, uh, had Marblehead looms down mm. at the public landing. So it was something that was not, I don't think we were battling anything to get into the marketplace. It was sort of a very creative time here. There was even and a head shop here. A there shop? was? Where the bus stop is now. A what shop? A head shop. A head shop? For all marijuana paraphernalia. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Which is <laughs> common now. But no, but I mean Marblehead really? had a lot of <laughs> It had a lot of rentals at that time, Creative. not condos. Yeah. And it attracted a different, you know, uh, maybe a lower income kind of person. Uh, and it was also the 70s when all of these things were very much in the air, all this creative, you know, people were d doing macrame and, and the, you know, the garden spot oh, yeah. where the right. you are now had all of these um, materials for handcrafting that's right. And then uh, Martha Mayo had the flower shop, too, across the street. And right. The, yeah. It was a time of uh, it, very much that was in the air in Marblehead. And I don't think we questioned it at all, what we were doing. We just did it because we wanted to do right. it. Right. Was that, would you say that was a nationwide movement, the craft mm -hmm. movement, or was it really specific to what Marblehead I don't know. was? You know, I, I think, I mean, certainly we know that people were doing tie-dyeing, tie-dyeing t-shirts and macrame. I mean, that was in the air but nationally, I, I think, but I don't know about I do th anything else. I do think else. it was because I've collected a lot of crafts and gone to craft shows, and craft had a bad name then. It was sort of like the macrame name or the um, woven pot holders or things like that, and, and we, as we Grew did not want to be associated with that part of it, and we had to keep our. I, I think that's why we got the Marble and Handprints name too. But we needed to be more of a. We went into the gift part of the trade shows when we did that later on, mm -hmm. because craft still had a sort of a negative connotation. Yeah, I mean, I, for me, Marimekko <laughs> was the, uh, you know, the goal that that type of clean design and good colors. And and then when you see what Marimekko did with fabrics, it wasn't just clothing, it was yes. pillows and wall hangings. Mm -hmm. and like we did. Mm -hmm. uh, although we <laughs> took a, you know, many more products. Right. <laughs> well, true. So did you felt you felt almost, correct me if I'm wrong, but you felt that there was sort of a standard you needed to 
live up to so you weren't classified as yes. a macrame? Yeah. We didn't identify with a craft movement, even mm -hmm. though looking back we were. Uh, we had a, a lawyer who was married, who, who represented Marameco, mm -hmm. and they lived That's in Marblehead, the Siemens. Yeah. Okay. Peter Siemens, and he Nanny was Siemens first. was one of our early customers when yeah. we were at Fred Woods. Our goal initially was to not spread nationwide or anything like that. We wanted to make enough money to go to Finland to meet the woman who started Army Mar 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 yeah. see what Marameco. Uh -huh. yeah. And actually, Nanny brought her to meet us. She and was in the States. On Sunday morning, uh, which was a huge thrill, because we were very new then. We were still at 78 Washington Street, and yeah. we had put our designs up on the wall there. We printed on paper and did all that, and we were really nervous about her coming to see us, because here is Marameco came to us instead of the other way <laughs> around. And she sweeps in with her black cape, and everything was very, I don't even know if she talked. She, she was she very austere and, uh, did she speak Not English? warm. Uh, no. She was, you know, she was. So she ended up. Very European, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> Finish. <laughs> she said, oh, I like that one, and I like that one. And luckily, one was mine, and one was Kathy's. Oh, good. <laughs> yeah, and, and, well, looking at it now, yeah, I know. she obviously knew I what she was know. doing. But well. she, but we didn't, she stayed maybe 10 minutes. Yeah. <laughs> wasn't so a long we decided we didn't visit. have to go to Finland. <laughs> I was going to ask if you ever made it to Finland, no. but you, no. you had your experience, right. that was good enough. <laughs> so with all these different um, <coughs> craft businesses, um, what well, you can look back on now and say are craft, more craft businesses, did, they act, did you all act as a support mechanism for each other? Or was well, we it were really part of that early uh, Santa Claus coming to Marblehead the, on you know, the, Christmas the Christmas walk. walk. We were part of the early Christmas walk organizing. Yeah, we were. We helped start that. But n we didn't get together as fellow cra owners of no, craft it wasn't, things. It wasn't, it wasn't any of that. that. Mm -hmm. We just kept moving along. We were aware of what people were doing, but you know, also it was a time when we didn't have a lot of money. And you a know, lot of extra time, Married too. people with little kids. Yeah. We didn't go shopping and right. buying other people's stuff. <laughs> So you had no idea also at the time that you were sort of involved in this craft movement? No. You no just it, that it wasn't a living. No, it, wasn't it was a, just uh, something. Yeah. And the whole women's movement and all that stuff, mm -hmm. we didn't think about that. We just did what we wanted to do. I had always made my own clothes and yeah, I did curtains, too. and you did too. So, it's, so it's we knew a, how to sew. We were familiar with fabrics and um, had you know certain ideas about what were nice fabrics and quality. and. That was important. Yeah, and right from the beginning, it was the quality, and we that's what we, sort of a mantra all the way through our business was to keep that quality even though we got bigger. So you, you mentioned the movements, the women's movement, which so that makes me wonder, um, did you feel that you had any advantage or disadvantage at the time? To me, I wanted to do it, so I did it, whether I was a woman or not. Uh, we did have some disadvantages initially because we couldn't get a credit card in our own name. Um, we had to have our husbands sign off on a lot of stuff. I don't remember when it was when we could get our credit card, but we then got a, a credit card for the company too, and you know, mm -hmm. it did progress in that way. But there were um, some obstacles in the way, but we didn't really think about it, I think we just kept barging ahead. <laughs> in hindsight, what would you say some of those other obstacles were? <clears throat> well, uh, under capitalization at the beginning, $50 yeah. each. Getting money. Uh, every time we had, and, and the th looking at the timeline, we saw how early it was that we needed a lot more money. 1972. Yeah, two mm -hmm. years, or we a year, we year did. and a half. And we had to finance an order for Saks Fifth Avenue in New York. Mm -hmm. That's the first time we went to the bank. And we had to go to the bank yeah. and, you know, we had to basically, I mean, of course, Proof. they wouldn't take our signatures alone. Our husbands had to. And then eventually we had to get a um, we second mortgage, second mortgage our on houses. our houses. Wow. At one point in the, I don't, it was still in the 70s probably. Right. But we, it, we would not have gotten money if we say we're starting a business and here's what we want to do. But because we had the order in hand from Saks Fifth Avenue, 
We could, and, yeah, we could finance. And then yeah. they ordered just for their Fifth Avenue store. It was in 1972 after we had just started the canvas line. And why we thought we could do that, I don't know. But we said, well, let's wholesale. And I picked up the phone and called Saks Fifth Avenue, and we got an appointment. So it was easy. <laughs> but then we, they but, had 22 stores. Yes. And that meant 22 billings. So we had waiting for 22 payments, buy the canvas, print on it, print the canvas, have it all manufactured, ship it, and Before then we got our money. Yeah. They would wait as long as they could to pay the 22 bills. Yeah. Mm. And I do have all the original orders from the 22 stores, and, and still, so you can see what, where. I remember when we were shipping them, we didn't have the money to buy go fancy um, packing stuff. So we went to the grocery store, I think probably went to Penny's and got boxes, and we were deciding who's going to get the Huggies box and who's going to get the... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So that was really the impetus to, to go and get more money you right. needed to because you had we to had for to. these things. There, we had yeah. no choice. Otherwise, you were, you were able to just sort of sell what you had, yeah. buy more, sell right. buy On a very more, small but scale. Yeah. And, yeah. Um, but that was the start of... So other than needing this financing, how did Saks Fifth Avenue approaching you change your business? Well, it made us visible. They did a I window on they, Fifth, Fifth Avenue. Avenue. And Kathy and I bags. took the train down and stood in front of the window. With you have the picture in the file. Yeah, of the window, but not of us standing in oh, front of it. No, we're there. I, I think we're, or maybe we're so? not there. No. You're right. I don't think we, we have an official window I there. Think, from Saks Fifth there Avenue. There might be a photo We of were us. listening to people, right. you know what we were doing and rock resorts which had four hotels in the caribbean mm -hmm. was across the street and they saw the window mm -hmm. and then David commissioned us to uh, yes. did we do all four yes i did Keneal bay saramar beach saramar and what was dorado it? dorado in puerto rico right. yeah and the only thing was we didn't get invited down there <laughs> <laughs> but we did designs for each of the resorts in both, and we printed on both canvas and the lightweight fabric and manufactured products for them. They didn't sell the fabric. Mm -hmm. So by this time, you're, you're you know, beyond your neckties and but your quilts. This is before five years. Yeah. That's right. That's what's yeah. amazing. I mean, this, what is the timeline with Rock Resorts? 1972. Okay. And so probably it was Rock Resorts was that. 73, probably. Mm -hmm. And so then, um, yeah, we did, do, that started other special designing for other, mm -hmm. besides moving us to the next step in Marblehead in our bigger store and having to fill it with all the products. We were doing this other stuff on the side, not and, on the and side. And that was a part of the... And so 70, well, then we did the Boston Symphony the and the... Museum of Fine Arts, Right. we did that first. I remember going in there and doing drawings of weather vanes and uh, I don't know if you did all that stuff too, but I remember the... And okay. then they picked out, we put some designs together and they picked out what they wanted and they manufac we manufactured for their store. Mm -hmm. um, and my mother always said, well, my daughter was in the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston. <laughs> <laughs> so and and then we also did Boston Symphony. For the Bicentennial. And uh, something for the New York City Ballet, and I don't know what that was. Uh, it was because I, one of my college friends worked at the New York City Ballet, and that's how I got the contact and but this is still within the first five years yeah. how many people are working for you now at this point I don't then know. we had a everyone was part-time we brought in early on we brought in a third partner nancy foster and she was a Stitcher. expert on canvas so she knew how to design bags and how to stitch bags and how she to worked for port train canvas. people to do that well, primarily sailing we bags at the beginning ted hood sailmakers mm -hmm was down at Little Harbor and we used to buy canvas from them. And it was really heavyweight canvas. And then we did go to Banger, you know, we got our other suppliers and they're the ones we bought our first industrial sewing machine from them. Because mm -hmm. so you can't stitch canvas with a regular machine. These were real heavyweight old Singer machines. Yeah. Industrial machine. So Nancy used to sit in the back doing the stitching and we'd be in the front printing. Industrial cutting as well. You layer canvas and use a skill saw. Or not a skill we had, saw. No, we had to get is a, it a cutter. standing? What is that? It was a cutter. Standing saw. It was for cutting fabric. Right. And you'd go through a number of layers at one time so you wouldn't have to do individual. 
But you have these Saks Fifth Avenue contracts and all these other ones you mentioned, and you're literally still doing the printing. You're standing there doing right. the printing. We're it's, doing yeah. the designing yeah. and the printing and running the business. I found, going through my boxes in Annapolis, the very first sales book that we had, and, and I don't know if it was when we were, I know it was 78 Washington Street, but I don't know if we had it when we were down in my house. Mm -hmm. But it's what we bought, when we printed it, and who sold, who we sold it to, and so we kept records right from the beginning. What year did we move to the corner? 1972. That's when we Washington had that garage, mm -hmm. which is now the clothing store, and we had a factory on the third floor. So the printing was done in the garage. It was the third floor was a factory and desk mm -hmm. for the office, basically. And it was the old Chadwick's hardware store. Mm -hmm. And people were really sad to see that go. I love printing, so I would usually print with whoever was, that was. Uh, we had Joey Schwartz, and we had... Uh, and we had a number of people. Yeah, printing. a number of people who would print. But we only expanded to six yards at a time instead of two yards at a time. <laughs> I think that's the maximum that, Yeah, we the could table do. was six yards long. Mm -hmm. But it allowed us to be more creative on printing on different types of fabrics like corduroy and we did a lot of experimentation. Mm -hmm. um, Velveteen. So when we found that we were expanding to the point where we couldn't keep up with the production is when we went to other hand printers. We just couldn't do it anymore. Mm -hmm. But there were, you know, people, and the first one was Lawrence, wasn't it? He did, yeah, up in Lawrence. Yeah, they did. I can't remember the name of the mill, but... Hand printing. Hand printing. Uh, I think they did wallpaper and fabrics. Yeah, there. up in Lawrence. So tell me about your workforce then. Was it mostly, you said it was part-time? Most was people were part-time. Mostly female, or...? All, we had... All female. Basically, one male stitcher later on. We can't who, remember his last name. We can't name. remember his last name. <laughs> was he would Charlie. come and pick things up and he and his wife lived in a trailer somewhere in Salem. But he used to stitch in the upstairs too. Not up in, uh, the, we were, when we moved the, across the street. Yeah. State and Washington. Well, yeah, that's right. It was across the street then. But um, well, we had one design, you know, someone named Charlie Allen, who I just recently connected with. Um, was uh, he brought in a design early on, which we pro I don't know, I hope we bought it from him. I don't think we just took it. <laughs> and, um, and then I didn't ever know his last name and never, you know, so it was really all these years later, finally was reintroduced to him. And, and um, he taught, <coughs> he's been teaching art all these years. At, at a, is it called the Penguin School or? Mm -hmm. Yeah. But the, uh, the first people we hired to do something was were stitchers, and I think they were doing the pillowcases and things like that. When Kathy and I were doing the ties by ourselves, we found her husband was much taller than my husband, so the ties would come out all these different lengths <laughs> and, you know, whatever. But so we started by people working at home and making things for us. Mm -hmm. And then that's what grew as a cottage industry and contract. So a number of these women had their own business at home, they would not just do stuff for us, but do for other people too. So oh. that's how it grew, and it just happened to be women. So, but when we moved to the corner, what year did we move to the corner then? 1972. Okay, 72. We moved to the third floor <coughs> of that building, um, State in Washington, and we had sewing machines there. So we had yep, some several, uh, probably four sewing machines. People and did our cutting. doing both mm -hmm. and the cutting. So you yeah. had people working for you. So we had people who house. would come there and work. Well, and we had to develop our own but patterns, But they could take too. things home. You know, we would set up packets, and people would come and uh, get the zip, you know, the whole packet of the zippers and the cut pieces, mm -hmm. and then take them home. And, but so it's like outwork. <clears throat> well, yeah. we, we were very organized. We were amazed at all the stuff, because you couldn't just give people stuff to sew and hope to sell it. We had orders, too. Mm -hmm. And then some people like to make Becky bags or whatever. Some people like to make zips and so we had to divide our orders up and who would be stitching what mm -hmm. and that's what I think Lois and Colleen did and that they were probably full-time at that point upstairs in the factory and and it wasn't well, they were supporting themselves doing yeah it. but there were a lot right. of people who were part-time who who really didn't want to commit to 35 hours or 40 hours a week 
Do you think it is coincidental, though, that they were women, or was it because they could work at home, take care of kids, or is that not the case? I don't know. I don't, I don't know who, who stitches canvas mm -hmm. in Marblehead. I, I don't know. It's just that hap they happen to be women. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't a, a thing on our part, oh, we're only going to employ women because yeah. we're part of this women's movement or anything. We just did what, right. what we could do to make the business move forward. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, <coughs> So then, it was, what year did we do the Nantucket? Because that was also the first five years. 1973. <laughs> you expanded so rapidly. Yes. It's and important to keep that in mind. Yes. I think. Well, we well, it was this enthusiasm and, um, and a little bit of impulsiveness, I think. Well, uh, we knew someone who was flying to Nantucket. You know, maybe we should go there and look for a store. Wouldn't it be so fun to have a store Nancy, in Nantucket? Nancy, go to Nantucket and see what you can find. And sure enough, and it was a terrible, I mean, it was just, it was a store on South Wharf. It was a little um, tiny little. It was it, the lease required that we be open April until October Columbus Day. Or yeah. And no one was there and there was no heat. It was like, yeah. And, oh, it was, well, I we, mean, you know. We we'd moved two other moved, times. Yeah, and two other places. But and, and the store was there until the end of our business. Yeah, so. we had, we were there 13 years. So you expanded rapidly. You're all you're all yeah. over the eastern seaboard, if not beyond well, that not at that point. All over well, at that point. Well, in, in Nantucket, no, and Nantucket and New York, and eventually. But New York, fields. the other thing that we didn't know. I mean, we didn't. There's a lot we didn't know, and we didn't know that uh, Saks Fifth Avenue would be seasonal, <laughs> and so we thought they'd be having canvas bags forever. Yeah. And of course, after summer season, they wanted leather. They moved on to something else. And so, <coughs> you know, there were no more Saks Fifth Avenue orders. But did they bring you back the following year, or was it no. one and done? No, it was one that one, year. Uh, one uh, off year. Well, no, over the years, we had other experiences with um, large department stores, like Jordan Marsh, and uh, what was it, Bullock's in Los Angeles. And we finally realized that we couldn't do it that way because they'd take a cut off the top and we couldn't make any money on that it just got our name around mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and the one we did I, Bullocks had ordered a whole bunch of deck chair covers I think and then by the time we were ready to do it they changed buyers and they wanted to cancel and we said you can't cancel we bought all this stuff right. and that also got us into when we were wholesaling to small boutiques our thing was 50% down the rest COD we mm -hmm. could not wait for the money right. Yeah, that's one thing we learned. But kept, all of yeah. this was learning by doing. That's what I was going to ask. So yeah. you, you didn't have a business sort of degree or background no. necessarily, but you learned while right. you right. were growing this business. And, and <laughs> early on, we generally it worked, and you know sometimes it it was harder. Early on, we we couldn't remember when we got our accountant, but he ended up being our accountant. It, we think it might have been we were uh, using Peabody and Arnold in Boston of lawyers. And that was probably because of um, Siemens, mm -hmm. who worked there. And then we worked with them throughout our business. And we think that it was them who recommended our accountant, who was in Framingham, because we wouldn't have known him. Mm -hmm. He's a CPA. And he turned out to be a teaching accountant for us. Uh, we would do all the work, and we'd sit down with him. And Kathy and I divided up all the financial stuff in the business. And she'd do the payroll once, and then I'd do the payroll, and we'd do, you know, so we knew what was going on. Mm -hmm. And then we would hand him all the stuff to do all the tax preparation and the profit and loss statements and things like that. So you're both doing the creative and, and the business the, side. Yeah. The and the marketing and the, you know, everything. It became more, a little bit more divided in that Molly was more uh, comfortable of being an outside person. And I really, you know, didn't I like making? I was things. the face of Marblehead handprints. Right. <laughs> no, Molly would be on an airplane and she'd be selling yeah. Marblehead handprints yeah. to the person next to her. I would never do that. Yeah. So uh, the our personalities uh, mm -hmm. complemented each other that way. And you stayed in business together for a long time, a lot so longer. you got along. We oh, yeah. we have well. absolute trust uh, because we, I think, um, absolutely believe in following rules. And we, integrity. You know. Yeah, the integrity of how we care about our own lives and, and our business. We never questioned if one person worked longer than the other or whatever. We would pay each other 
we pay ourselves equally. Right. And when we needed money in the business, we personally put the same amount in. Right. And um, it just yeah. No, I don't think we've ever had an argument ever. No. But you know, it's a, it's really a matter of trust. Yeah. And uh, did owning the business and everything that you had to put into it to make it so successful and to last as long as it did affect your personal lives at all? If I can be so bold as to ask that. <laughs> <laughs> Well, let's put it this way. Both of us were divorced, I think, four years into the business. Right. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so it was a period at that time in the 70s when that was happening Th a lot. Everyone is also, they were doing but crafts and getting yeah. divorced. <laughs> but then you're divorced and you're still raising your Well, I was a single mother then. for seven years and I right. had to, yeah. we had to make it work because I didn't want to have to go into Boston to get a job. Can I ask how, how does that work with, with the, you mentioned earlier the, the business issues, getting a credit card, getting a loan. You needed your, at that time, husband's co-signature on right. that. So what happens right. when you're a uh, single? Established enough. Okay. I mean, what, right. four years? <laughs> 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 but, um, I mean, we had, I don't and know. And I think the laws changed, too. I don't know when they changed. Yeah. But I don't recall having any trouble no. personally getting. Okay credit cards or anything Opening like that. our bank accounts and stuff. And but then what year did you move to Annapolis? 1981. Okay, so that was 10 years in. And how did that change the business? I met my now husband of almost 40 years in Marblehead, but he was living in D.C. And we commuted back and forth for two and a half years, and I thought, oh, something's got to give here. And of course it was me, so Kathy, I said to Kathy, I can't move. And she said, oh, well, we can make it work. So at that time, we were having all these other stores owned by other people, but they were marvel at handprints around the country. And we were doing um, national trade shows, which I was overseeing. I, I did all that stuff. Kathy didn't like doing that. So right. I she was got the, biz, the outside marketing business, and, uh, and I'd do the trade shows. And I started in D.C., Boston, New York. We did San Francisco once, too. So I was able to keep control of all of that from a distance. Mm. And then I opened a store in Georgetown too. It's even <coughs> doubly impressive because we're n there's no email. No, no, there was no computers. There's no computers, right, <laughs> exactly. So you're on the phone with these people, yes, you're right. mailing. That's why you've got boxes of papers. <laughs> that's right, yeah. <laughs> and that's why when we did the Saks Fifth Avenue store, I was on a panel up at, my, at Skidmore College and talking to students about the business. and student raised her hand and said, well, how did you get that order? I said, well, I picked up the phone. And nobody, none of the students pick up their phones anymore, and everybody <laughs> laughed. It turned out that a woman in Annapolis, a young woman, uh, was married to a sailmaker who was college roommates with Robbie Doyle's wife here in Marblehead, and she came up to visit, and they came to our store. And they said, oh, this would be great in Annapolis. She wanted to have a business she in Newport. She had been Newport. a school teacher, yeah. Right. So they came to us. Mm -hmm. And throughout the, all those years and all the other businesses, we never went out and sought the business. And it, that's kind of really rare, I think. These stores were... La Jolla, California, Houston, over. Texas, Indianapolis. That's what I mean, it's nationwide. Yes. Um, and it was a certain part of the Florida. public. And it wasn't just a preppy look or whatever certain element of the public who liked what we were doing. And we started out, um, the first two, and I just found the papers today, as franchises. And then we, it, it was too much legal burden on us to be in that business. And we worked out with our lawyer a distributorship deal. So... Like a license to use the name. They okay. licensed to use the name. And then, because they wanted to look like Marvel at Handprint Store, we could not dictate what they bought. But every year, or every quarter, I guess we did, we'd come out with our products on a wholesale sheet. And when the store started, I think I, um, you might have done it too, but I remember doing sample things for them to start their store, mm -hmm. um, sample orders. It allowed us to manufacture more so we could then go to other manufacturers to have our designs put on things, because then, you know, the, then not, not now because of all the computer generated designs and everything, but we had minimums we had to do of like 10 dozen or something if we wanted to do mugs and we couldn't afford to do that on our own. So 
like with the, uh, I can't remember who did our mugs, but um, they then sold them wholesale and we could buy them for our stores. Mm -hmm. So it would allow us to go out and we did this with clothing, we did this with paper products, we did it with right, a lot. glassware from Libby, glassware, mm -hmm. matches we had, uh, you know, the little Marblehead matchbooks. Um, so it allowed us to expand the product line because we had all we, we had, had the stores more, yeah, manufacturing more. capability, but it was also more work on our part because you know we look back through our records and see all our our production lists. We had we didn't just buy the cannabis and other fabric and have it there ready. We did it according to our orders, mm -hmm. so we didn't have a lot of inventory sitting around. Yeah. So we would make people do an order six months ahead of time for Christmas or whatever, and. I guess I was doing all that and sending right. it out to them. And then we knew what to buy for our raw materials and how much fabric we had to print. And we, that's how we kept control of it. We needed to put time aside to design because we were running the business. Mm -hmm. So we had a, I think by June something, we needed the designs and we each did six and then they were put into the calendar. We would choose occasionally from the calendar for new fabric designs, but we didn't do 12 them. <coughs> new fabrics no. each year. That gave us a, a deadline mm -hmm. to come up with the designs, because otherwise we were going in a lot of different directions. Did other people come to you with designs? A couple. I think you alluded to that. We right? had, uh, no, we had, no, we had um, oh, employees. Joey. Joey Schwartz did two or three. Linda Wallace did one. My um, daughter did and one. And Libby. <laughs> Inslee did yeah, the, um, fish. the fish. The fish? Oh, yeah. really? Libby Inslee did the fish. Remember, oh, Melissa fish. did that, that thing in fifth grade, and it's called Melissa's Print now, but I did it in two repetitive things. So we, we, it wasn't just us. Yeah, you but see. But we the, were the majority. Yeah. Hmm. But that was, you know, I mean, we <clears throat> tried to make the company interesting for the people who work there. If they had an idea, they could pursue it. We said, take some fabric and do yeah. body and bring it back. And if we liked it, we would. So any put it on any our store. one who came in, we would do that, especially with employees, and uh, it just just to make it interesting. And I think that kept us sort of as a, a creative hub here in Marblehead, because that's where we would put things in the store that might not sell well, but we could experiment with them, and then. We did not wholesale everything because some things just right. weren't worth it to wholesale. Mm -hmm. And so we used it as an ex sort of a lab. So what are some examples of those? The, this, those well, sculptured the animals? The sculptured animals that Nicole Fontaine did. They weren't did. toys. Yeah. Right. Um, the, uh, the dolls. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Paul, Pauline, Pauline Nagel's, Nagel's dolls. dolls. Uh, little Christmas ornaments people Nancy Sanders yeah. did. Looking back on it, we had people working for us for years and years. Mm. So it was the atmosphere that we created, I think, the creative mm -hmm. atmosphere, which got us into trouble sometimes, too, but too many ideas. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> too many ideas to do anything with? Or well, or that's what made to? us go in a lot of different okay. directions right. sometimes. <laughs> but, yeah, I think it was, as I said, sometimes <laughs> we were impulsive, and I think uh, that was good energy, but, it, you know, you have to be a little bit moderate sometimes. I think when we get got to the closing part, what helped us close was that we had really done everything we wanted to do with the business and more that we hadn't even thought of, like the special designing uh, for the museums and we did mm -hmm. colleges and stores and other things. And who can say that um, Seiji Ozawa and Fiedler. Arthur Fiedler <laughs> wore our ties, right. <laughs> you know, things like that. We were really national and we decided to stay that way and that way we could keep control of it. At one point I think people started saying, why don't you go get your fabric done in the Caribbean or there, and we, we wanted to keep control of it. And that was good and bad, but, um, but that's why we kept going to different hand printers too, because we, we just didn't turn it, we didn't want to be a printing factory, but we could control the direction mm -hmm. of it as we were going along. And it's just very gratifying to today to still see people using our stuff. Oh, mm -hmm. I know. And then I tell people what I did, oh, marble at hand prints. And it's just, no matter 
where we are. And we were reading a letter today of a woman who wrote to us when we were closing. And uh, it was just, and we had a lot of those right. type of letters yeah. of how much they loved our stuff over the years. And when they traveled abroad, they would be easy to pick out our bags on the, the baggage thing. Molly was, you know, in Annapolis at that point, And mm -hmm. I was the one in Marblehead with the manufacturing in the Marblehead store. Yeah, she had the... And, um, frankly, uh, the weather, January through... March? April? April. <laughs> Uh, I felt so, I mean, we had to start building for Nantucket in probably March, but actually the gray, snowy days, there would be one person in the store, and I would feel so guilty about that person being in that whole <laughs> building by herself. And, you know, that was, you know, I, I just, I didn't like that part of it. And then also we had, as Molly said, we had done everything that we were interested in doing the last two years I spent painting dinnerware, and that's what, you have nine boxes of those coming. Uh, <laughs> but I was surprised at how much of that had sold. We did everything that we wanted to do, and our lease was coming up okay. in where Gene Arnold is now. Ten more years. And I honestly did not want to do that any longer. So we went from our late 20s, early 30s to into our 50s, and that's a big Looking back at it now, we have bigger chunks of our lives, but that was a big part of our lives with the, getting the families and the, all the stuff that we did. Mm -hmm. And um, we couldn't imagine going another 10 years. Right. <laughs> was no, it really I bad? Mean, I really, yeah. I honestly, had, I was interested in doing something else. I mean, I, just to run a business is not interesting to me. I like making stuff, <clears throat> and painting dishes for two years was fun, but, you know, even that... A long um, time. <laughs> so we gave the town a year's notice of our closing that we were going to close at the end of the year and by the end of <clears throat> the year we had sold all the sewing machines the zippers the well, they cutting the everything except the things that you're but, going to get <laughs> but the people um, all our customers we gave them time to do special orders Mm -hmm. Oh, nice. So they were all, we got all this stuff right. in we, it. Yeah. And the reason we closed rather than sold the business, we do had, we had two men, buyers, who wanted to buy the business. And we got to the point, I have all the records, I was looking at them again, of almost signing on the line. And then for some reason we decided the amount of money we would have been getting for it, I mean, anybody can manufacture. The value in the business was our designs. And we decided we didn't want somebody else taking them and doing really bad things with them. Some, we found some pair of women's underwear in Filene's basement once with our design on them. You know, who did that? I don't know. I have a mug for you yeah. that's a counterfeit mug. So we had people copying right. us, but over the years. But we, and I had heard of other people who had created their business and sold it and were really sorry afterwards. Well, design research. Yes. And that was so, is that an example of gone back? That was an example for me. Oh, yeah, okay. and we decided we'd See rather that go downhill. That wonderful store retain the the uh, rights to our designs, mm -hmm. and sort of control our image and integrity for the future. And here we are, you mm -hmm. know. Um, so we did have some people trying to copy us, and that people tried to do stores and do things like us, and but they didn't last very long. And any time we saw a real copyright infringement, um, there was a company that did made dresses, and it was in a country traveler show in Boston. And I went in there, and I walked in, and I said, well, that's my design. It was on, it, they didn't even bother to change any lines. And in a design, if you take a dot out of it, it's not yours anymore. So it's, it's very, uh, but they didn't, I was not a straight line person, so mine were all hand painted the lines. and I and was in our color combination and our lawyer managed to get them to cease and desist and we didn't have to go to law you know any trials or anything or suing but um, I think it was those things that we wanted to maintain the integrity mm -hmm. and people say you didn't sell it no I mean the amount they were basically buying our manufacturing and stuff and we had all the patterns that we developed and but right. we decided it wasn't worth it so what did you do afterwards? What happens in your well, life? I got, I was in DC at that time and I had gotten in, um, there was a 
organization called American Women's Economic Development. It was part of the Small Business Administration Office of Women Business Ownership. And at that time, it was, I guess it was the early 90s, they were trying to do, um, their goal was to have a business center for women in every state to be available for. And so I said, well, gee, I, I know from beginning to end. And I called up the office, and it was only the executive director at that time, and I told her who I was, and she said, oh, Marvel at Hamptons, and I started volunteering for them. And that's where I ended up being director of special programs and counseling, developing workshops and training programs for women entrepreneurs. And it was, it was really right up my alley, and I really got into that. And I, with my, the background of our business from start up to end, I was able to relate to a lot of people. But then I got to the point of uh, taking what I learned there and how entrepreneurs learn differently from others uh, to develop the program that I, I got going at, at Skidmore College for Business for the Arts. It took me 10 years to get off the ground, but it's in its seventh year now. So, we're, we, it, so I took what I learned and applied it in a different direction. That one year <laughs> when we gave notice, I started doing um, art classes at the Cambridge Center. And I think that first year I went in maybe one or two days a week. And then for the next, well, total of 10 years, I would go in four days a week. And actually had an apartment in Harvard Square that I could use. And um, so basically I've been painting all that time. See, I was and that's what I do. Yeah, I was an <laughs> art major in college, and Kathy was a psychiatric social worker, I think. <laughs> right, yeah. So, and then it turned out that I did art therapy, which is part of social mm -hmm. stuff too. So, you know, our, we had totally different backgrounds, but it it meshed, and we then went and took our stuff in different directions. Right. Mm -hmm. But you never you never lost contact. Oh all, no, obviously, no, no, maintained of course that not. through the years. Yeah, we're like family. That's awesome. <laughs> So, don't be modest, but what would you say the legacy of Handprints is still to this day in Marblehead and, and beyond Marblehead? Remember? One of the reasons I saved all this stuff for 20 years in my storage locker <laughs> is that it really, uh, you know, I know a little bit about Marblehead pottery and Sebastian figurines, mm -hmm. but that's about all I know of. Um, comparable things in yeah. Marblehead. Mm -hmm. And I realized that, you know, 100 years from now, I mean, it's already been 50 since we started this business, but 100 years Almost. from now yeah. and going forward, uh, there will be people really interested in this because it was involved so many people in the community. Mm -hmm. And um, it really, I mean, often we had 30 people on our payroll, and most of them were local people. Yeah. And so um, that's what I view the legacy as being. And I was so pleased that the museum was interested in appreciating this for the future. Kathy thinks that there's probably not many people in Marblehead currently who might, might have known who we are, but everywhere I go, I can't believe you had marble at handprints. They were like, and it, it feels like it's, as I said, this article that was written about me this summer up in Maine, and it was because she knew I did marble at handprints, wanted to do the story of it, and it turned out a woman who worked for her had a marble at handprint bag under the counter. These old, she used it as her knitting bag. It's just um, everywhere, and I think we, the we kept with the quality and the the integrity and the good design designs that are still popular now because of the simplicity of them. And um, I think we made a lot of people feel happy. I think that that's the, a the great color. See yeah, the colors, they come into our store and they say, oh, it, it, it was just so bright and cheerful. And we got so many notes from people over the years. And it was, it's just really gratifying to know that we touched a lot of lives, I think. When we mention handprints today to people who who are are younger than 50, who are in their 30s and 40s, it's still, it's positive memories and positive, they're positive present too because yeah. they still have their bags. 
Well, and people think so we're wonderful. just a bag company, but we well, had 300 right. and, and some <laughs> products. <laughs> exactly. And I think at our 10th year anniversary, we had the old bag contest, remember? We had a yeah, lot right. of things around the anniversary time. And um, we had a road race. We I mean, road we did. races. We, <laughs> what else did we do? What? <laughs> just, um, we you know. we taught classes there. Yeah, we, we did. did. We taught silk screening classes, quilting classes, um, deck home decorator things. Remember, we would have people come into the. We store. did decorator show houses. Show houses. I did that using too. Uh, uh, Pat and a lot of uh, the and paint. what's his name, Pat and what I don't But I used a lot. It was in. Uh, Medford couple who did something. professional decorating. But again, that was another thing. Said, I don't know how we found out about it, but I said, oh, why not? And so Kathy said, well, you can do it. <laughs> <laughs> so I, you know, we had, uh, we have great color mm -hmm. photos from that. But I used a lot of people in Marblehead to help me. We did the carousel antiques, and we had flowers by um, Mayo, and we did. I, we just brought a lot of people in, and then when we somehow I got a painter to come in and do it, it was a girl's bedroom, and he found out we didn't pay him, and he found out other people were being paid. I was, <laughs> we were good at getting people to do things for <laughs> us, <laughs> and yes. it worked. Absolutely. And we worked in fabric showrooms in New York and San Francisco. It was a springboard for me to continue in another direction, but along the same lines of learning. I, well, while we were in business, I, I think you made me go to this financial management for non-financial managers. It, it was a place in Boston. It was like two days of rolling my eyes. <laughs> I went and sat in on Harvard Business School uh, audited classes, and th that was frustrating to me because I couldn't talk, and they were talking theory, 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 and I wanted to say, what about the budget? And it's, So uh, that's where I learned, too, that entrepreneurs learn different, in a different way. And the whole point of the programming that we did was to put one foot in front of the other and keep moving forward. I know of other partnerships that have been really ugly. Oh, yeah. Ugly, breaking up divorce type of yeah. Uh, yeah. bad things. <clears throat> and um, I don't think we realized about each other that we would be good partners. But yeah. I think that is absolutely key. Is that it's either my friendship or my business. I said, well, don't go into business with your friends. And, and then family-owned businesses. And it was just, uh, it worked for us. Mm -hmm. It doesn't work for everybody, but mm -hmm. it was. Um, yeah. But the basis of our relationship at the beginning was silk screening. Yeah. And then we became friends you know, over the years and, and trusted friends. Mm -hmm. It's still a matter of luck to some degree that you did get along so well and then well, I think it is yeah. because it was. Well, I don't think uh, she would have. We would have decided to go start printing together if we hadn't. No, that, that's some right. There was a, right. yeah. a compatibility, but um, you know, it's uh, you know, I mean, uh, like our third partner, Nancy Foster, didn't want to or couldn't sign some of these. Um, well, actually, she didn't own a house to sign yeah. a second mortgage when so we she had to get this financial responsible. So she wasn't as financially able as we were. Mm -hmm. And we uh, eventually bought her out. But yeah, we <coughs> it it that did not work. And then you get two against one too when you have three people. Yeah. So that <laughs> Kathy and I said, We're it <laughs> In a way you make it sound so easy. Oh so you're so successful well, so quickly. Yeah. For so many years, yeah, yeah, the energy. I think part of it was the energy and enthusiasm, and and uh, op I mean, all entrepreneurs are optimistic. But we were realistic in a lot of. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So anyway, that's it. <laughs> awesome. In a nutshell, yeah. <laughs> the end. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm.